cyber these days is very much geopolitical tension. Um, so anyway, um, so I've spent the last three decades working with small and mid-sized businesses. I am a former MSP myself. So to those of you who are MSPs, I had my own MSP for almost 20 years merged into a larger regional friendly competitor, and then we were acquired by a national competitor. So I've worked in a small, mid-size and large MSP along the way, um, published a lot of pieces, um, written a couple books, do a lot of, have done a lot of volunteering in the industry, a lot of advisory boards. Um, interestingly, I never had working for CompTIA on my radar at all. I was actually a CompTIA member for a good 20 odd years and actually a member of the board of directors. I'm a former chair and an opportunity came upon it for CompTIA to start up this ISAO and the board asked me if I would take on a project to evaluate that and which I did recommended that CompTIA proceed. And then CompTIA asked me if I would run it. And um, I really feel like this is sort of the, the classic right thing at the right time for the right reasons. Um, CompTIA mm -hmm. is a very mission-based organization and we are on a mission to raise the cybersecurity resilience of, of the tech industry, specifically MSPs. Um, I've testified on cybersecurity. I'm very involved in the IT sector coordinating council, which works very closely with the Department of Homeland Security and CISA. And I've been an FBI InfraGuard member for a number of years. So that's a little bit about me. Now, a little bit about CompTIA. CompTIA is a large global organization. Um, we have, if you will, kind of two sides to the house. We have our certification business, which generates the revenue that allows us to then invest in things like ISAO and membership on the trade association side. So we're able to provide significant member benefit for minuscule dues because we have this very fortunate revenue side of the business with certification. For example, you can't work for the Department of Defense without, I believe it might now be up to three CompTIA certifications. I could be a little bit off on that, but um, we do a lot of, of certification work globally. On the membership side, we have member communities. So for example, we have an MSP community. We have a cybersecurity community. We have that where members come together and collaborate on needs within the, uh, within the industry. And that drives a lot of our educational um, offerings as well as many of the res uh, resources we put out. We do research annually, which is again, vendor neutral. So we do state of the, um, state of the industry. We have a very good um, property called CyberSeq, which maps the, um, uh, the workforce gaps in, and where the best tech employment is around the country. Um, we have significant workforce initiatives. We are, we are very committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we've, for many years, done a lot of work with underserved, underprivileged communities, bringing them into tech to Stan's point, we agree. You don't need a two year, four year degree to get into tech. So we've launched something called the CompTIA Tech Career Academy, which is non-traditional education to get into a high paying technology job. Um, a lot of that's done through our charitable foundation, the Creating IT Futures Foundation. We do public advocacy work. So we have a federal cybersecurity committee that works closely on government issues. And we try to bring the small business voice into that to try and help make sure that what government does has applicability and is operationally viable for small mid-sized businesses. That's not typically something government's terribly good at. Um, we're hoping to make a change there. And then of course, cybersecurity. Um, within the CompTIA umbrella, we have 15 different cybersecurity initiatives, whether it's our cybersecurity certification pathway. I've mentioned some of the... Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. All right. Siri likes to do this to me when I'm on Zooms. I have no idea why. My watch always does that. The other thing I'll forewarn you about is I have an allergy to Zoom. I swear to God, I do not sneeze unless I'm on a Zoom. So <laughs> if it happens, I'll beg your forgiveness. Um 
but we've got we've got an initiative called Tech Girls working with young girls. We've got an initiative that's working in the school system, trying to equip middle school, high school teachers to be able to talk about and teach technology curriculum that's not just coding. Um, there's a lot more to the, to the world of tech than coding, as you know. We have a great program called Cyber Ready that runs in the UK. We've just launched an apprenticeship program here in the US. So as you can see, CompTIA has a lot going on. Um, so just a wonderful organization. So and one thing about CompTIA is we always set priorities for the year. So for this year, um, we've really focused our priorities around business technology solution selling to help MSPs learn how to sell differently in the ever evolving market. We think that it's no more about, um, as, as you may have heard, speeds and feeds. It's gotta be about solutions and about the, the, whole, the whole way that a business leverages technology to meet their goals. It's, it's, a, it's a soft sell, it's a consultative sell. A lot of MSPs consider themselves accidental entrepreneurs, you know, maybe, maybe come from an engineering background and went out on their own and you know, just need these soft skills to learn how to grow their business. So CompTIA tries to help with that. Cybersecurity best practices is where I live, obviously. I mentioned the workforce, DEI, and then we're also very involved in driving the adoption of emerging technology. I don't know why I just did a blue man group thing there. I guess my background was getting the better of me. Um, but um, that is so weird. Sorry. I, that's never happened before. It's a new one. Um, but driving the adoption of emerging technology is a really interesting area because we're seeing MSPs who are specializing around things like drone technology or big data. Um, and, and applying AI to that. So a lot of interesting things happening in the market. But let's talk about what we're here to talk about. So what is an ISAL? And the URL at the bottom is a significantly expanded version of this, of, of this slide, but a really great piece that our team put together about an ISAL. In 1998, there was what's called a PDD, a Presidential Decision Directive, PDD 63, that created what are called ISACs, which are Information Sharing and Analysis Centers. ISACs were created to address critical infrastructure. So for example, there is an ISAC, there is a nuclear energy ISAC, there's a natural gas ISAC, there's a banking ISAC, health ISAC, aviation ISAC, all of the areas defined by the federal government of, of, of critical infrastructure have an ISAC that is purpose focused on that area of critical infrastructure. Fast forward to 2015 during the Obama administration and President Obama issued executive order 13691, which created ISAOs, information sharing and analysis organizations. The intent there was to extend the success of the public-private information sharing that ISACs were doing to communities of interest, vertical industries, um, you know, non-critical non infrastructure specific. So you have many different ISALs out there. As we've talked about, CompTIA has the CompTIA ISAL, which is focused on our membership, which are predominantly MSPs, MSSPs, um, cloud solution providers, you pick your acronym, and then the technology, uh, sorry, the vendors, distributors, and consultants that support that IT channel. Um, so an ISAO, the, the real purpose of an ISAO is to share critical threat intelligence that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. So the whole premise of an ISAC or an ISAO is sharing cyber threat intelligence. A significant share of that cyber threat intelligence comes from government sources. In the US, it comes from Homeland Security, CISA, FBI, Secret Service, you name it. UK, it comes from the National Cybersecurity, um, shoot, what is it? National Cybersecurity Council and GCHQ, which is their equivalent of the CIA, on and on it goes across the world. Um, but a lot of cyber threat intel comes through government sources. A lot of open source cyber threat intelligence as, as organizations have become more tuned and plugged into the true nature of the cybersecurity threat, you're seeing more and more um, threat intelligence coming from 
organizations, private companies that are analyzing trends out there and, and putting cyber threat feeds out there. So when ISO brings all this information in, and I'm sure you've probably heard the phrase drinking from a fire hose, that, that's technology in general. For me, when you talk about cyber, it's a water cannon. You're not even getting a sip. You're just getting pinned against the wall and you're paralyzed because the information flow is so strong, so fast, so broad. Most MSPs do not have the resources to manage that, let alone interpret it and correlate it down to actionable information, actionable steps they can take to secure not just their customers themselves. One of the one of the real concerns I have for the MSP space is that, this is a personal opinion now, I believe far too many MSPs are simply inserting another S and declaring themselves to be MSSPs without having the appropriate skills on staff to truly deliver a managed security service. Now I say that meaning no disrespect to anyone who said that they are an MSSP. I fully hope and trust that you do have that expertise. But for those MSPs that are smaller, I'm a big believer that partnership is the path to truly providing good security services, partnering with an MSSP, partnering with a SOC provider or a SIM provider that can augment and complement your staff so that if you're a pure play infrastructure MSP, don't go try to build that cyber expertise. You can't do it quickly. It's going to take years, but you can partner with organizations that can bring that to the table very quickly. And those, those partnerships can help you interpret cyber threat intelligence and turn it into actionable information that will help your business and help your customers. The role we play for our members, because our members span that continuum, right? I have members who are couple person MSPs to couple hundred person MSPs. Now, obviously you can, you can go across that scale and very quickly understand that the smaller MSPs do not have cyber analysts on staff. The largers, larger ones have their NOC and their SOC and they have their, their appropriate cyber analytical people, their cyber expert, experts on staff, and they have that function internally to monitor, the SOC is monitoring what the NOC is doing and making sure that things are done and secured properly. We help bridge that gap. You know, we, we see a real need and a mission to help educate those MSPs who want to become more what I call cyber mature for lack of a better word. So we share that threat intelligence in actionable ways so that the MSPs that don't have those resources on staff can actually benefit from it as well as the MSPs that do have those resources on staff can equally benefit from it and do their own threat hunting and analysis if they want. It's got to be because it got dark out that I'm having this blue man group thing, because usually <laughs> if it's light out and I have my green screen, that I've never really? seen that happen before. Um, Interesting. It, it, bizarre. It's a yeah. first and the lights are on. I don't know. Uh -huh. um, so we're also we're also really focusing on building a trusted community because that's key to working with cyber threat intelligence. Here's, here's, the, here's the real brass tacks of the equation. Bad guys have been sharing this information for years. Why do you think they're so far ahead of us when we're, we're playing defense? Because yeah. the bad guys are sharing, whether it's on dark web or in, you know, more tightly knit groups, they're sharing what successful attack vectors they're, they're following. They're sharing what TTPs, what techniques and, and that they're using to make these breaches. We're not doing that in, in the public private space. There's far too much holding of the cards close to the chest. Um, I personally believe we have to really change. And I think that Sunburst, I refer to the SolarWinds event as Sunburst because it really wasn't a hack of SolarWinds. Um, you know, th this seems like a pretty tuned in group. So I'm sure you're all well aware that that, that event was really an espionage event and it was simply carried out completely electronically. And in the old days, you know, whether it was the Soviet Union or, or someone else, you know, that they, they'd get some of their agents to get hired by the companies in roles. And they, you know, do you ever watch the Americans? That's the way it used to 
you know, used to happen. Today, it can all be done remotely in cyber. And that's what that event was. It was a, it was a very well designed and executed intelligence operation. So we really need to change the conversation. And, and one of my big concerns is that we're, we're living in a culture of cyber shaming. I mean, just just remember the remember the target or the Equifax hack. How much how much you know um, negative press and PR did those companies endure? Now, last time I went into Target, it doesn't look like very many people were concerned by that. Their stock price may have taken a hit, but there's a lot of traffic in Target these days, so they didn't suffer for it. But they kept those cards so close to their chest until they didn't have a choice but to talk about it. And then we very quickly found out guess what? That was a supply chain attack. So should what, what just happened with Sunburst and SolarWinds be any surprise? Absolutely not. But, the, but one of, I believe one of the enabling factors that allowed it to take place is the fact that we've got this culture of cyber shaming. There may be, we may yet determine that there were several organizations that saw early indicators of suspicious or malicious traffic on their networks, but they didn't come forward because they didn't want to take a bad rap for coming forward. Well, what if they had? What if they had and enough other organizations started looking to see if they were seeing similar behaviors? Might that have created enough friction in the system that the bad guys might have backed off and reconsidered how they were going to approach this? And might that have allowed appropriate defenses to come into play to prevent it when they came back to do it? Don't know. Theoretical conversation, but it's yeah. a critical conversation that I believe needs to happen. And whoops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to click the wrong one. The other reason we've done this is that MSPs have been targets, right? MSPs are the neck of a funnel. Here's the MSP. The MSP has hundreds of thousands of customers. That's the broad end of the funnel. If I can attack that neck and penetrate those systems, especially the remote monitoring and management systems, I can attack hundreds, if not thousands of customers at once. And it's happening and it has happened. And so we're very concerned about that for the integrity and reputation of, of the IT services industry, that if we don't get a handle on this, it could put a lot of us out of business. So we, you know, CompTIA, again, being very mission-based, the ISAO has really become a, a mission-based initiative. Everyone in the organization is 180% behind this because we feel like as a trade association for the industry, we have an obligation to help our members be better at security. Well, so to jump in just real briefly, yeah. that's part of why when we were introduced, it was like, yes, come talk to us because what you're doing, it seems to me is just, so I want to say it's, it's a no-brainer not to get involved with, you know, yeah. because everybody... Would, I would agree. <laughs> yeah, of, of course. So just to amplify what you're saying, you know. No, I appreciate that, Stan. Yeah. So our mission is simple. It's, to, it's a, to advance the cybersecurity resilience of the global tech industry. And <clears throat> as I said before, we, we, serve, uh, we serve as the focal point for technology vendors, MSPs, solution providers, integrators, distributors, technology consultants, and their customers. So what, is, what does that mean? I've talked a little bit about it, but you connect to an incredibly powerful network of over a thousand member companies that are in the ISO right now. We have about another 200 that are queued up to onboard right now. Um, we're growing rapidly and that's a good thing because the more that are involved and the more that are contributing, the higher the quality of the threat intelligence and the reporting that we're producing becomes. But it also allows us to build that trusted community that I talked about that really helps foster, you know, open discussion, best practice sharing, you know, what challenges are you having? What questions do you have? Do you need help with something? Um, we have a very active online cyber forum that I'll talk about in a bit where a lot of these, these discussions are taking place. Um, so it's a great way to build trust and gain allies to help, you know, that this isn't a business, so, and, and this isn't a business and cybersecurity is not a discipline that any of us can win in isolation, we have to work together. Um, so, you know, we work hard to try and equip you with the information to help ward off threats. 
because so many MSPs in, in our research and, and in our understanding of the market focus on tools and technologies and techniques. You know, what's the right firewall to implement, the right antivirus to implement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's one piece of the, of the equation, but without an understanding of the landscape and the threat intelligence that's out there, how do you know how to best optimize those technologies and most importantly, monitor them so that you know if something's going wrong? Because guess what? It will. You know that. That's why you're here. Um, there's no organization that's immune to, to cyber threats. And then we also believe very strongly that it demonstrates thought leadership, commitment, good corporate citizenship. Um, you know, we have, we have several organizations, large organizations like Verizon, who are involved because they believe it's the right thing to do. They believe that they need to help their partners and all the associated companies that, that you know, swirl around together have to be better or else that damage that could happen that I talked about could filter all the way up to Fortune 500. So that there's a there's a big social corporate responsibility element to it. Um, I think we were talking before some folks came on, but I, I was saying that, you know, I believe very strongly that that cybersecurity is is I often refer to it as an existential threat. And what I mean by that is it doesn't just threaten a business or a government. It truly threatens our global economy and society as a whole. We've, we've seen some of the dangerous things that can happen when when, you know, malicious actors are, are left, you know, unchecked to to do what they do. Mm -hmm. So um, we just celebrated a year, a one year anniversary. That, that's a graphic that we made for that over on the left. We, um, we started March 1st of 2020. Great time to start, right? What happened 12 days later? The world shut down. Um, so it was an interesting time to, to start, but we did. We took over what was called the TSP ISA, which I was actually recruited um, to help with back in the fall of 2019. But that was associated, um, some of you may know the name ConnectWise, um, those, those of you that are MSPs. Um, it was started by the former co-founder of ConnectWise with the intention for it to be a standalone nonprofit entity. But the way that, that it was announced, it was misperceived by, um, by the industry as being something happening just for ConnectWise. And so um, very quickly realized that for this to really take off and be successful, it needed a new home and CompTIA was the, the logical choice. So CompTIA took it over March 1st. Because of the pandemic, CompTIA went into a protective mode of operation to protect our employees and the business and make sure that we didn't have to let anyone go through the pandemic. And we were very, very fortunate that we did not. Our, our senior team was very um, just had incredible foresight to restructure and protect the business and, and we kept um, we kept everyone on board through which was great so what we did is we came up with a model where we went out and recruited a half a dozen what we call industry partners and those companies are some of the logos you see in the graphic and they provided the funding that got us off the ground um, and now that you know now that things are are you know, reasonably stable, we're able to invest a bit in, but we're still primarily trying to run this as a self-funded entity. So every dollar that we raise through the ISAO is reinvested directly into it. Um, we're run by three governance groups. So we have what we call our Executive Advisory Council, our MSP Champions Council, which is just made up of MSPs, and then our Subject Matter Experts Council. And they provide guidance and input for the strategic direction of the ISAO, all focused on making sure we're delivering the best value that we can to our members. Um, and, and directly as a result of that, we just formed our first special interest group around information sharing guidance and automation to help MSPs share potential threats and consume potential threats in a way that can help you operationalize it to secure yourself and, and your customers. We partnered with the IT ISAC. So I mentioned ISACs. The IT ISAC's been around about 20 years, services the IT critical infrastructure sector. So IT ISAC members are large enterprises primarily, but we partnered with them to leverage their 
team of analysts rather than go out and stand up and, and recruit our own analysts to get to get up and running we've partnered with the iti sac and that partnership is working extremely well they do really great work for us we also partnered with true star as our threat intelligence platform so that's where our members can consume and submit and share bi-directionally threat intelligence with other members of the isau so since September, when we started producing reports, we've produced over 330 actionable threat intelligence reports. When we produce a report, it's typically, if you're old enough, some of you are, some of you don't look like you are, but if you're old enough to remember traditional newspapers, <laughs> there's, there's the, the, uh, the um, metaphor of above the fold, below the fold. And that's the approach we take with producing our reports. There you go above the fold to get you to you know see it on the newsstand and buy the paper we put you know here's the threat here's what it means to you and then you know if there's room we put and here's what to do to protect against it or work around it if any workarounds or mitigations are available below the fold we've got all the technical details so the cves associated with it, the iocs links into the true star platform links to third party information related to it so that if you are a cyber analyst we give you all the lovely detail to go and threat hunt and and geek out on but if you're not and you just want to understand it more from a direct business impact and what do i do about it we provide it that way as well so we think that that is a unique angle on threat intelligence reporting um, because of the partnership with the IT ISAC last fall, we were the first ISAO to release um, an alert with actionable mitigation recommendations on the Microsoft Net Logon vulnerability that came out. And we've since written a very detailed report about MSPs and ransomware and the threats that MSPs specifically face, as well as a detailed initial post-mortem, if you will, on Sunburst that primarily came from the FBI and, and a lot of work that, um, that Mandian did with very specific step-by-step -step recommendations to both validate whether or not your environment has been impacted, and then a lot of monitoring recommendations in the Microsoft 365 environment based on learnings from this event. Um, so really good actionable information that you can use. And we also produce a weekly written and video report that sort of snapshots what we've seen over the past week as far as active cyber threats and concerns to be aware of. So look, you know, the, the video report, for example, is a is a 10 to 15 minute video. I listen to it every week. It's three different people talking. You don't need to look at them. You can just, you know, you can play it. You can look at them if you want, but you can also just play that and consume the content as you're working on other things. So we try to produce a lot of different types of information in different consumable ways so that our members can consume in whatever way is best for them. Sorry, I'm a fidgeter. So I've got a fidget spinner in my in my left hand. If you see, see that pop around the screen. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned our cyber forum. So this, this is a glimpse of, of our cyber forum where we have, you know, all sorts of information, but we've got I forget how many forums we have out there now with active discussions going on there. There are thousands of posts out there now. And then we have obviously our threat reports that we release and we categorize them TLP with the traffic light protocol, if you're familiar with that, which governs how it can be shared. We also have started doing monthly member meetups. So an open Zoom like this for ISAO members to come together. And we've got you know anywhere from 25 to 75 people that will show up and just ask any question. They might be asking for help on a specific issue they're dealing with related to cyber, might be talking about a current threat, might be talking about something in a report, you know, whatever it may be. We've got our analysts on these. We've got some a uh, couple people from TrueStar. So if somebody wanted to talk about something specific to maybe API integration with the threat feed, we can do that as well. Um, and it's it, this becomes a launch pad back and forth into all the other CompTIA member benefits that are available to our members. We also have the threat intelligence platform. If you're at all familiar with it, this may look somewhat familiar, but um, one unique thing that we did when we negotiate with TrueStar is every member gets their own instance of this, if you will. So you can have your own private instance of TrueStar where you can do your own threat hunting. You can use it like your own sandbox. And if you find something that's 
you know, useful that you might want to share with the ISAO, you can do so. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, MJ, if you would say a little bit more about that last, uh, how that works. True that, Star? The True Star, yeah. Yeah, so that that's a threat intelligence platform. So we have threat feeds that are hooked up to this. So um, we get feeds from the Homeland Security Information Network for, you know, there are, there are lots of feed sources out there. You've got um, Alien Vault is a big one. Um, oh my gosh, there are several, you know, considered premium Intel types of feeds. These feeds all come in. And then the one slide I didn't have is you, you can get a graphical orientation of a threat. So whether you're looking at a specific IP address or a hash or, you know, a CVE, you can plug these in and then you can start to see this graphical representation. It looks like a spider um, with all the different nodes that correlate that. And you can look to see what those nodes are and you can extract, you know, for example, if, if you're dealing with um, a particular threat that has a list of IP addresses, you can extract those IP addresses and very easily put them into block rules on your routers and firewalls and what mm -hmm. have you. Um, there are integrations to other platforms, be they SOC platforms, SIM platforms, that you can feed this threat intelligence in to give your partners or your staff more data points to correlate and validate if you have true active vulnerabilities happening on your networks or your customer networks. You can, speaking of MITRE, you can, you can map everything to the MITRE attack framework. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we look, you know, that there's a, it's a very powerful system. You can, you can validate against open sources as well and try to, you know, try to make the determinations. Do I have false positives or not? You know, something that Sims do a great job with. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very, very robust platform. And one of the projects that we're working on this year is um, implementing what we're loosely calling right now a member profile where our members can go in, specifically our MSP members can go in, enter their technology stack. So if I'm an MSP and I work with WatchGuard and Fortinet firewalls and Sophos antivirus and on and on it goes, you can put all that information into your member profile and we'll then match that with tags to the threat intelligence flowing through the TrueStar system so that we could actually send a ticket back to the MSP if there's a match to their stack. And we think that will do a lot to bring the, the overall noise level into focus because you know, rather than have to look at every threat report that we release, what if I could just send you a ticket whenever I see a threat related to something in your stack? When you get that ticket, then you know, uh-oh, I need to look at this. And then at your leisure, or leisure may not be the right word, but <laughs> you know, you could create other processes to then go in and, for example, look at those weekly reports or look at some of the vendor reports that are being posted to see if there are any threats that you're concerned about and want to spend a little more time investigating. Mm -hmm. Does that even jump to uh, things like sticks and taxi where you yeah, this is all, I mean, Sticks and Taxi is, is a core to how a lot of this information is, mm -hmm. is, is exchanged, excuse me. Um, you know, sometimes there are direct API integrations, but Sticks and Taxi is always there as the underpinning. See, uh, to, this to me is where, I mean, and I'm not an, I'm not an MSP and I've never been an IT vendor, but it just nevertheless seems to make common sense to me. If, you got, if you're an IT vendor and MSP and you've got that thousand clients you're talking about or a hundred where you're the top of the funnel, well, that same thing that the site, if you get hacked, it's bad. If you, it seems if you ingest this in and automate the process of protecting your customers mm -hmm. through automation into their firewall or their sim or wherever you're doing that's a game changer yeah yeah you know at, that's where the um the special interest group that we have that's looking at information sharing guidance and automation is going to become very very important because yeah. if you don't you, you know it's no different than you know i oftentimes think back to to my msp days which aren't that far in the in the, in the rear view mirror but you know, there were many times I'd be sitting down with the customer and the conversation would very much be around, you know, okay, why are you making it so hard on yourself? Let's, let's look for a more efficient way to do this. Yeah. And, and certainly 
cybersecurity takes that to a whole nother level just due to the sheer volume. Um, so, you know, we're not going to solve this problem in the near term, but we're sure as heck going to chip away at it. And, and you know, we're, we're constantly getting feedback from our members, which is so critical to me because everything CompTIA does on the membership side is member driven. You know, if our members tell us that something we're doing just doesn't provide any value, we're not going to do it. And, 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 and we have very active communities that provide that that critical input that we need mm -hmm. to help make sure that we're, you know, especially with something like this threat intelligence, it's, mm -hmm. it's a bit of an opaque concept for a lot of people. And, and so we need to do the best job we can helping to provide the tools and education that the members need to be able to leverage this because you will see and, and from what we understand could always change. But certainly the Biden administration has said more than any other administration about the fact, and, and there was one, I can't remember who said it, it might have been the president himself, um, but, but there was some very direct commentary around the fact that, look, private enterprise isn't being successful. Government isn't being successful. We need to work together and figure out how to be successful and protect both. And so we're expecting that there will be some pretty, if not specific, very directive language in the executive order that's forthcoming around cyber about improving the public-private sharing of information and the partnership. We're already hearing it in the meetings that, that I've been part of with the folks at DHS. They're just waiting to find out what the marching orders are really going to be because mm -hmm. the nominees to, to run the cyber side of Homeland have been a little bit delayed. They, they, everybody had hoped they would have been in place by now, but it looks like they will be over the next month. So things are starting to come into some clarity, but you got to get mm -hmm. the political process done and get those people confirmed. And then you can really, the hope is that they'll hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. So if, first of all, I guess, if you're not already a member of the iShow, how does one become a member. Or you can go to the website and, and all the information is there. If you're already a CompTIA member, you can add the ISO on to your membership. One thing to know about CompTIA membership is it's company-wide. So when you join, it's for the entire company. If you're familiar with ISOs, you'll probably be a little shocked that our dues are only $500 a year to be a member of the ISO. Um, with CompTIA dues, it's a total of $850. CompTIA excuse me, core CompTIA membership is $350 and the ISO is a $500 add-on. Mm -hmm. But, excuse me, not to, be, not to be flippant or arrogant, but if you can't find value, um, <laughs> a return on that $850, it's simply because you're not even looking. Um, yeah. There's a, you know, a lot of, I know of several other ISOs, ISACs, where the memberships are in the thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. a year. And that's the benefit that we bring to the table as a nonprofit association where, you know, we've, we've structured our dues model based on a project, projected number of members to augment our, our cost structure. But I can tell you that membership dues, um, boy, I'm not even sure it's a double digit percentage of our, of our budgets. Um, our, our dues are extremely low and just contribute to covering the costs to, to run these programs. Yeah. And what you say about pricing is, is, is so true. I was surprised the, the price being that low because John Coleman and I have talked about that. We, we had the financial uh, security ISAC at yep. one of our meetings, John, remember a couple of years ago. And pricing is a function of size, but right. it, it's really hard to, for a small community bank to afford to really get value out of the ISAC that way. They're, right, they're getting right. so little information. We really tried to make it, you know, for, for lack of a more eloquent way to say it, a no brainer, because yeah. we, we, you know, we firmly believe that not only does it benefit the MSP, but to your point, you know, the, the last MSP that I was involved with, um, we had several community bank and community credit union customers, and they would directly benefit from us being an ISAO member. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we'd, we'd be able to augment and help them with their cybersecurity strategy in a much different way by virtue of the information we have access to. And that has a lot of value. You know, that, that gets back again to how MSPs are changing how they work with their customers and becoming much more engaged in the customer's business functions and what they need to do to manage risk. We, we've even had, I can't validate this specifically, but we've had some suggestion from a couple of insurers that we talked with that it would be, you know, there would be a favorable recognition of an MSP belonging to an ISAO when it comes to their cybersecurity coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there are a handful of things like that that are happening out there with different areas of compliance and, and liability and whatnot, where there may also be some distinct benefit there. Mm -hmm. Could help with some pending regulation. We just don't know yet, but we're keeping our eyes on that. Um, there, there are many ways that it can be beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing that same thing. Let me open it up. Anybody else have some have questions? I don't mean to hog MJ. Uh, Oops, John, I think John's yeah. talking, but muted. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, it's a little slow on the, on the uh, uptake there. Yeah, just quick question. Um, so since the um, advent of the presidential directives, creation of the ISACs, and now the ISAOs, and um, you know, greater proliferation of standards, those were, to me, those were like, that was like a quantum leap in, in you know, the uh, information and expectations regarding information security over the last 10 years. Do you see any big changes coming? Maybe not that on that order of magnitude, but, you know, where do you see the big changes coming for information security officers and information security professionals where they ought to be looking, you know? Yeah, boy, I, I wish I had a crystal ball that I felt <laughs> confident in there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I really do believe that the upcoming EO will give us some better insight on that. But I think um, what I can say is that certainly looking at everything from the risk perspective is really going to only amplify over time. And I think, you know, MSPs, there, I asked the question earlier about, you know, risk and, and even to the point of individual accountability, you know, is, is the CISO going to be on the chopping block if there's a breach? You know, I, I would actually argue, unless you can prove negligence, absolutely not. Because guess what? I don't care if you have, and who's ever going to qualify this, but I, I've talked to a few people who, I've talked to a few CEOs who have told me they have the best CISO in the business. And I just nod my head and say, okay, you and, you know, three of your colleagues feel the same way. But, you know, my point being, unless, unless you've got a situation of gross negligence, you can't start firing your, your entire IT staff or your cybersecurity leadership if there's a breach. Because guess what? There's going to be a breach. It's, it, it's it more going to be a function of do you know when it happened, where they went, and how long they were around? In some respects, it's no different than thinking about, you know, the, the age-old common house burglary, right? If your house gets broken into, what's most important? Okay, when did they break in and how? Did they come through the front door or the living room window? However they came in, where did they go? What did they see when they went there? Did they take anything from the places they went? And most importantly, are they still there? Is it safe to go into the house? Yes. And if they are still there, where the heck are they? And how do we get them out safely? And if they left, did they go out the same way or did they punch another hole in the perimeter? You know, we've got to just, just so changing the conversation and not, not to get a little flippant in my response, but I think, you know, one of the biggest, biggest issues at hand is changing the conversation. The conversation can't be purely defensive. It can't be punitive. If you, if we get breached, you're you know you're out of here. That could be the dumbest thing you could do ever, because that 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 person, those people, might be the best ones to help forensically analyze what took place and learn from it. Because mm -hmm. um, they're afraid to, they're afraid to say something. That happens. Well, correct, and that gets me back to cyber shaming. I think we've got to, I, you know, and forgive me, I 
can get on a soapbox at times, but you know, <laughs> Go we've got to change that because we need companies to come forward. We need individuals to come forward and say, I think I'm seeing something. Help me validate that. Yeah. Whether it's through the government, through ISOs, through ISACs, through peer groups. I don't truly, I don't care how it happens, but it has got to happen. Yeah. I feel very strongly about that in case that didn't come through. And, and I would only add to what you said, because I agree with everything, but even as it's not a matter of if, but when the breach occurs, there's still to what extent was their governance and leadership and culture that tone is set at the top and you're more likely to be breached. It's more likely to be a bad breach, et cetera. If that understanding of culture, leadership, systemic risk, all of those matters aren't also being yeah. managed. I think, you know, in general, I think we're making, I'll, I'll call it reasonable progress in creating a culture of risk awareness and individual responsibility. But from a leadership governance standpoint, you're, you're spot on, Stan. There's, matter of fact, the, the last major, uh, yeah, I think it was, the last major breach that I was involved in for a customer was 100% due to a lack of the most basic business controls in their finance department. You wouldn't even, you would think I'm making this story up if I told you. Um, and it, 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 it was, there was, there was not a, there, there was one technology component to this breach that they experienced. The rest of it was all internal process control procedure, lack of oversight and, and checks and balances. Yeah. Yeah. We, we sadly just saw a $500,000 business email compromise. That was exactly what you just described. This one was about a million three. <laughs> yeah. right hand and left hand I just, yeah. yeah yeah so I, you know you they, those i think another um so so more toward john's question i think a, another big big item that has to be addressed is the bringing together of the technology controls with the with the business process controls and mm -hmm. and most of those are human um yeah. and, at the end of the day, it's so funny. I, I testified before a House committee back in 2009. And, and a long story short, in an exchange with a congressman from Southern California, ironically, um, I, said, I said, with all due respect, Mr. Congressman, there is no technology in the world that can get between your finger and the enter key. And that's, still, that's as true today as it was 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other, well, other I, questions. I, I had one, just one thing to, to insert there, and that was whether or not, um, whether or not, uh, MJ, if you're familiar with uh, the challenge, this, so what you're kind of articulating and the challenges you're articulating, um, uh, I think many would argue is uh, an issue of that we really don't have a, like an IETF of security. We have an IETF, we got RFCs and kind of, a, kind of the Bible of how the internet works. But, but there really is no commandments or Bible of the internet up until the, the, a project called cyberstability.org, which we've discussed at Secure the Village. Um, and that concept of having norms, cybersecurity norms that um, have to be followed from the top down. And with that, that's, a, that's kind of that, the, the mindset function rather than just the footprint of um, you know, basically cross-referencing those functions. So I'm curious if CompTIA is aware of those global norms by the Global uh, Council on the Stability of Cyberspace, um, uh, or if you if, if that's part of the discussion right now in terms of that tops down problem in um, information sharing. Yeah, no, I I, I am not. Um, nor do I believe that we are organizationally. I have not heard of it um, in the organization, so I will um, I will definitely look into that. You know, it's it's we've um, you know we've primarily taken the approach of of building off of the NIST framework, because we, we think that that's been the most, you know, broad-based to date. Um, you, Com CompTIA is not one, we don't, we're not a standards organization, so we don't create standards. We don't in necessarily endorse standards, though in the case of the NIST framework, we have two cybersecurity products, one free, one subscribed. Um, the free one is called a, um, 
uh, cybersecurity channel standard that's based off the of NIST framework, but it's kind of scaled down for MSPs and, and injected with a lot of advice and recommendations from our subject matter experts in the field. And then we have something called the Security Trustmark Plus, which is an organizational credential. I, I, I jokingly refer to it as the good housekeeping seal of approval for, uh, for cyber. Um, that's more rigidly tuned to the NIST framework with some specific audit requirements and, and you know you have to meet the controls you can't just pick and choose which is what a lot of MSPs we see do today is you know they'll, they'll look at a control set whatever it is and say okay well these are reasonable to implement these are not reasonable to implement so I posted on chat yeah thanks I saw that so, yeah you know, there is a lot of talk, right? A lot of discussion. Matter of fact, I was I had a meeting about it today with the IT sector coordinating council. There's there's a lot of discussion about making sure that the work that's done. So these are there's there's the IT sector coordinating council. There's a government coordinating council, telecom community. Anyway, these are these are councils that were formed by Homeland Security under CISA to really tighten up the connection between the private industry world and CISA on the, on the initiatives that they're working on. And so CISA will ask these groups to, you know, go out and, and research something and come back with recommendations from a working group. And one of them is an SMB working group. And we were talking quite a lot today about the fact that, again, depending on the priorities that come down from the administration, we've got to make sure that they don't just address the enterprise world. It's mm -hmm. got to address the SMB world. And, and Stan, I think you mentioned earlier, you know, the sweet spot of 50 to 500. Well, depending who you talk to privately or in government, you know, is that small or are we starting to get to medium? And yeah. is it defined by number of people or is it defined by revenue? You can have a 10 person company that does $10 million in revenue. Is mm -hmm. that really a small business or is they starting to cross over? It, yeah. You know, it all depends. So, you know, ultimately the SBA tends to be the driver of those designations. But mm -hmm. the point is, you know, everybody broadly agrees that the SMB space is the major driver of the U.S. economy when you when you look at it. And so we have to make sure that whatever comes down from a standards perspective, from, you know, whatever we've got to remember that we have to pay attention to the two partner law firm in, you know, I'm in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We're an hour North of Boston. We're a city. Anybody want to guess what our population is without the Google? I'll tell you <laughs> 21,000. We are not a city. We're a town. <laughs> we are a town. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, so, you know, what do we, I, when I had my MSP, which was based here years ago, people used to ask me, oh, well, what's your vertical specialty? And my, my sarcastic response was, if I had a vertical specialty, I'd come down as fast as I went up because there aren't enough to sustain. I couldn't be a legal MSP in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I absolutely can in Boston. I can in the suburbs of Boston, but I can't in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. There just aren't enough law firms and the law firms aren't big enough to pay, you know, afford the types of services that a legal, S, legal MSP is going to bring to the table. So, you know, we've got to make sure that we don't forget Main Street in any of this. Mm -hmm. That's, I'm going to, that's a call out and I'm putting it in the uh, chat box as well. Cyber, Cyber yep, Readiness they do good Institute. Stuff. Yeah, I'm on their advisory board, small business advisory board. Yep. And as a matter of fact, they're, they're running a program right now with, um, Global Cyber Alliance, they're, 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 they just pushed out their cyber basics. It's mm -hmm. very basic, but yeah. it's good. Oh. It's, it's, you've got to start somewhere. That's right. We're struggling over how do we help these small businesses even discover whether they need IT services? Right. How do you navigate that? What is to me a very basic question. Sure. Yeah, uh, that way. Absolutely. Anyway, uh, we, we got to kind of begin to wrap it up. Okay. I want to make sure though that other people are happy. If you've got questions uh, for, for MJ, uh, please jump in. Um, and I'm going to take away, I'm going to unshare your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I That's okay. I got yeah, it. There we go. Um, 
and go back to my point, my PowerPoint. Yeah, because I just want to remind everybody, um, we'll be back in a month. We're going to have a, a the, the discussion in a month is a CTO and a CISO walk into a bar. Uh, my business partner, David Lamb, uh, who is also my arch nemesis, if you know David and me and our relationship over, over the years, um, he's the CISO. And Mike Paul, who's the chief technology officer at Innovative Computing Systems, uh, is the CTO. And these two have been working together for years on common clients because we share several clients in common. And it's all about, okay, so how do, we, how do you navigate all the challenges that come up? between IT and, and, uh, and, and information security. That's part of, these are our programs. And, and you know, we got a lot that we're doing. If you're at all involved in the workforce, please join the workforce working group. Amy's periodically will show up at that MJ. Nice. I'm just so grateful. She's doing you. amazing yeah, work. She truly is. Uh, but we have this one focused on the technology and security intersection. We've got, uh, as John knows, the financial services cybersecurity roundtable. So if you play in that space, please join us there. We've got two events, one a Monday security leadership hour and the other, uh, the security and privacy leadership team that meet just around general topics. That's what you were talking about, MJ, where you get all the technical people talking together like in a meetup. This is technical people and lawyers and insurance people. And you know, we want the whole world. It takes a village to Secure the village, if you will. And then I've got my monthly webinar on the second Thursday of every month. Uh, we've got uh, coming up next month, uh, the Cybercrime Support Network. I will be talking to them about, again, doing great work in that small business and the resident side of, of things as, as, as well. So definitely try to make as many of these fit. Steve periodically will run a cybersecurity for residents program. We've done uh, several on cyberbullying. If you've got an interest there, talk to Steve. His email's in the chat box and we can coordinate an event uh, for, for that sort of, of thing. Uh, more generally, sign up on Secure the Village. It's free for right now. If you sign up as a cyber leader, signing up your company as a cyber partner, we're building a village square. And in the next few months, we're gonna transition to, we're gonna charge to beyond the village square as we grow our own mass and, and all. But for right now, it's free and there'll be a, you know, a rollover for that if you get in soon enough. So, so please do that. If you're a cyber partner, let us know. We'll promote your events. Uh, we put stuff on, on our library from you. So let us know and introduce us to your friends. Uh, bring them to meetings. Uh, this is how we're gonna grow. One person knowing another person, knowing another person, hey, you know, I'm off to a meeting, come join us. What you guys did, Brendan and Ellen, I mean, it's just, that, that's like so phenomenal. You know, th thank you for doing that. Uh, we're gonna start sponsorship. We don't, we only have one right now, but that's, that's in the cards as we roll out, you know, kind of, we're looking at now, how do we make money so we can become sustainable? That, that's our next event. Follow us on LinkedIn as well. Uh, share us with your connections. Uh, our next meeting date is, May 25th. How was this one? What worked? What could we do better? Well, I'm not sure about that, Mike. MJ Shore, though, you know, we've got to talk about him a little bit after he's gone. <laughs> okay. uh, we, we just I, I would say it was it was very informative as always. And, um, you know, uh, certainly learning every time I come out here. So uh, I, MJ did a great job at presenting. I actually asked the team at my company, uh, uh, are we members? And uh, are we members of just CompTA? Are we members of both? So I'm, I'm doing my investigation on that side. Um, and if not, to see if we, you know, kind of push them to say, well, maybe we should. Um, but it was very informative. Thank you very much, as always. Good. If you want, I'll, I'll be happy to drop off if you want to have a, you know, <laughs> oh, no, a no, yeah. conversation. I actually have to drop off. I got to get going. But. <laughs> oh, yeah, too, but MJ, that was excellent. Thank you. I am on the executive council for the managed services community. So, Oh, fantastic. Mm, uh, your name came up several times in the last few meetings. And of course, during uh -oh. the national conference. Oh, no, there was what you've done with the, the in the national conference was uh, the breakout sessions were amazing. That's what I've heard. So. Nice. Able to, I was doing my own panel discussions on solution selling. Yep. Oh, that's great. Yeah. 
That, that is Gary Brendan. Uh, also, just a shout out, I'm also the author, it connects to the Rainbow Coalition, to the gay and lesbian thing. Uh, I started writing essays on freedom, uh, the Thanksgiving after 9-11, uh, compiled about 70 plus of them into a book that went all the way to essays through July 4th of 2020. I think I wrote the last one that's in the book. Um, and it's my search and it all leads back to what the Rainbow Coalition and all are all about, that we're all created equal and it's we the people. And that, that's kind of where my search has, has taken me. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing here is a non-political piece of, to me of, of that. You know, the, what, the, what the founders just envisioned for, and the, the quote of Bobby Kennedy's at the beginning, that the future is not, uh, you know, is, 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 is the, the future is an accomplishment. We, we got to work to get there. So I, I invite you to take a look at that on Amazon. Uh, also take a look, please uh, download um, Steve's app. The uh, thing is on the, the you know, the, UR, the, the name of the app is on the, the chat log. You can save the chat log. If you go to the bottom of the chat log, the three dots on the lower right, uh, click that and save it um, as, as well. So you all have it. We do uh, download the app. We're really looking for feedback. Think of this as much as a beta version as the final version, because we know we've got to make it better. Uh, we just know that the only best way to do that is to throw it out into the community and, you know, let the village secure the village as it were. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Very good. Yeah. Cool. So, um, any other thoughts, any final words before we adjourned? I'd just like to thank you, Stan, for the opportunity and thank you all for your questions and, and everything. I've really enjoyed this and I look forward to staying connected. Good. Do you thank have you anybody so to much. recommend, you know, future speakers as well? Yeah. And, you know, conversations to get the conversation going. Oh yeah. I dialogue, mean, dialogue between our panelists for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We'll organize the Troikas or those of you who are engaged in it. And that's how we do this. You know, one plus one is a thousand. You know, I say that as a PhD in mathematics. So, you know, <laughs> and I always put my tongue in my cheek when I say it, but it's true, you know, so. Uh, okay, uh, thank you all. Thank you, MJ, really super. My pleasure, thank you. Yeah, thanks, MJ. Okay. Excellent. It's a pleasure, enjoy your evening, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much. Really appreciate so everything. Much. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thanks. Bye. Ciao. Arrivederci. <laughs> Open the wine. Auf <laughs> Wiedersehen. <laughs> okay, I would have clicked the end one now. It's